Welcome to The War from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. As we heard uh, when we played the episode of Four for the Fifth, there was great concern about assuring that the Allies didn't have to come and deal with another world war. Today's program covers much the same ground and was aired uh, right after the Yalta Conference, which made uh, quite a few plans regarding the uh, reconstruction efforts. Some of these plans would be frustrated or changed as a result of the Cold War between former allies, uh, United States and the Soviet Union. But this is a look at uh, one plan for what should happen to Germany after the war. So here from February 13th, 1945, is the episode, What to Do with Germany. Words at War. Middletown, USA, 1985. Listen. It is the sound of marching feet. What does it signify to you, listeners? They're probably soldiers, aren't they? Yeah, what is it? A parade? No, my friends, it is not a parade in the usual sense. These are not soldiers. The rhythmic tread you hear is being made by slaves. Slaves? Did you say slaves in America? The United States of America? Impossible. Ah, but listeners, this is the year 1985. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime, presents another Words at War program. Tonight's book, What to Do with Germany was written by Louis Neiser, American attorney, orator, and writer. Numerous international statesmen have referred to his book as the Bible for Peace. How well this description is merited was revealed today when from Yalta came word of what the big three planned to do with Germany. The seven main points proclaimed by Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin are the identical seven points on which Mr. Neiser has written his book. No program, therefore, could be more timely than the one you are about to hear. Our adaptation is a little imaginative, but as you listen, remember this. It is founded on fact. Yes, listeners, incredible as it may seem, this is the fact afforded by fancy. This is America, and these are slaves you hear. Worker slaves returning from factory to home, marching in close formation under the hawk's eye, the watchful stormtrooper. Say, what's happened? What kind of America is this? Yeah, what's going on? Patience, friends, here comes the answer to your questions now. One of the denim-clad marchers drops from the formation to enter his home. Let's follow him. Dad, are you home? Yes, son. Here I am. Oh, I didn't see you sitting there in the dark. Why the blackout? I was just thinking here. It always seems easier in the dark. You can put the light on. There. Gee, you look tired, Dad. What have you been thinking about? What is there to think about? The past, of course. Always the past. Yeah, well, Sunday again. Here are the food vouchers for the week. And look, Dad, look what I got for my birthday bonus. A voucher for a new pair of shoes. That's nice. And I, I too have a present for my son on his 14th birthday. All week I've been wondering what to give you, and finally I decided it should be the thing I cherish most. Something I've been saving for a long, long time. It's in that little package on the table. Ah, oh, Dad, you didn't have to. Now open it. Thanks, Dad, but I really didn't expect... Why, it's... It's a statue. A little statue. Souvenir of New York. Well, this is swell, Dad, but... What is it? Just a cheap little souvenir, son. But I've kept it for many years. 
It has been very dear to me. What's that she's holding in her hand? A torch. The torch of liberty. And that, that's the Statue of Liberty. Of course, you don't know what that is because it was destroyed before you were born. Oh, before we were slaves, you mean? Yes. Before Germany ruled the world, it was a symbol of freedom everywhere. You will always keep this little gift of mine, eh? Even if you keep it hidden. Keep it especially in your heart. Of course, Dad. Sure I will. The Statue of Liberty. Gosh, I'm always learning something new from you, Dad. The other fellows don't know about any of those things. The things you told me. About the Constitution and the way it used to be before the Germans came. And the presidents and the elections and all that. Remember what you told me about the World War Wars? They wouldn't even believe me. You know what one of them said? What? If, if the whole world beat Germany in the First and Second World War, how could she get big enough to beat all the other countries in the third one? And what did you tell him? Well, I, I guess I really didn't know what to say. You didn't tell me about that. How did it happen? I suppose... Well, I suppose you might say it happened because the nations of the world had proud hearts and poor memories. It's one of the most tragic stories the world has ever known. And maybe this would be a good time to tell you about it. It's been running through my mind all day. Well, what happened after the First World War? Start there. All right. That ended way back in 1918 with an Allied victory. Germany was crushed completely. Hungry. Poverty-stricken. But would you believe it? Within 20 years, Germany had grown again to be the strongest military power in the world. But how? How could they do it? Why did the Allies let them? Well, that, my son, that's the first chapter of this tragic story. It's a story of pride and deception, of generosity and guile. After the armistice in 1918, all those who had suffered from Germany's ruthlessness counted her crimes and demanded that she be punished. It was the unanimous report of the Peace Commission that we have found evidences of cruel and barbaric German practices. The murder of wounded soldiers, the massacre of civilians, the poisoning of wells, pillage, torture, these and other violations of international law are among the most striking list of crimes that has ever been drawn up. They are so vouched for that they admit of no doubt. They cry out for justice. Yes, Germany's guilt was well established and the Allies prepared to try the guilty individuals. But the Germans set to work with deceit and lies and threats, with red tape and clever intrigue. It was a farce, a comic opera. From a list of 10,000 war criminals, in the end, only four persons were actually convicted. They were tried in a German court, and they escaped scot-free. The peace treaty also prescribed punishments for the German nation as a whole. The Germans were to pay for the ruin and destruction they had caused. Their army was to be reduced, and they were forbidden to manufacture munitions. For a long time, the world believed that these punishments were actually being carried out. But all the while, this was what was going on inside Germany. Don't worry about it, Herr Krauss. When the attack comes, Germany will be ready. After what the Allies have done to us, they're not allowed to have more than 100,000 soldiers, no munitions, no planes. How? How will Germany be ready? Herr Krauss, you are as blind as a tourist. Let me ask you, what does your factory make? Lipstick cases, you know that. Exactly. Well, have you no imagination? What is very much like a lipstick container? A cartridge case, yes. Oh. And look, what do you th do three nights a week and all day Sunday? You mean the glider club meeting? Yes. Do you think we've got so many thousands of glider clubs just for the fun of it? Now, there, there, I've always seen a good point. A little more training and your glider pilot becomes an excellent fighter pilot. Well, there you are. And what about the hiking clubs, yeah. the rifle teams, yeah. the gyms, yeah. you see? <laughs> Everyone is getting ready. Every German is training day by day. Of course. <laughs> How stupid of me. Not stupid. Just a little nearsighted. <laughs> like the Allies. <laughs> so you see, after the First World War, the Germans were not punished. And they were not disarmed. And when the Tag came again for the German people, 
they were very well prepared indeed. That was 20 years later, in 1939. World War II. Again, Germany stood against the nations of the world. And again, she broke every rule of international law. But this time, it was even more horrible than the first. As you order, Colonel, the entire population of the village is lined up here. Good. These French dogs. They will learn that we mean business. Very well, Lieutenant. Give the order. Well. Fire! <laughs> American fire troopers, Colonel. Fourteen of them. We can no longer afford to take prisoners, Lieutenant. Interrogate these Americans. After that, have them all shot. But, Dad, did the Allies let them get away with it? Well, they said they wouldn't. The leaders of the United Nations, President Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill, and Premier Stalin, issued a declaration. The German officers and men and members of the Nazi party who have been responsible for the above atrocities, massacres, and executions, will be punished according to the laws of the countries in which their abominable deeds were done. Most assuredly, the Allied powers will pursue them to the ends of the earth and will deliver them to their accusers. And while their guilt was being proclaimed throughout the world, while defeat grew nearer and nearer, the German government again laid its plans. Commander, the prisoner Hans Guy stays here. All right, send him in. Send him in. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Sit down, prisoner, Geister. Thank you, Commander. Is the time up? I'm happy to tell you that it is. You have been here six months to the day. Ah, at last. I must congratulate you on the administration of your concentration camp, Commander. <laughs> It seems more like six years since I was interned. Geister, believe me when I say I realize how courageous you have been. You have done your duty to the Fuhrer as well as any soldier in battle. Thank you. Perhaps better. By committing yourself to this concentration camp, you have established yourself as a safe German. <laughs> Not only on our records, but in the eyes of the real anti-Nazis and eventually... In the eyes of the United Nations. <laughs> <laughs> you and the others like you will be invaluable to the fatherland when we are defeated. Germany's destiny will be in your hands. How did it end, Dad? Did the German trick work? Easy, son, easy. First, I want to tell you about the hidden money. You see, in World War II, the Germans had stolen billions and billions of dollars from occupied Europe. In the preparation for the defeat, all of this fabulous plunder had to be safeguarded. Ah, good morning, Senor Valente. Draft or deposit? Good morning, Senor. Another deposit. Here. Two hundred thousand pesos. <whistles> oh, excuse me, Senor. <laughs> Perfectly all right. It is a sizable amount. Por Dios, it certainly is. I think your company is doing very nicely, no? Well, it's no secret, Senor. We are doing very well indeed. Ah, Valente. Back from the bank already? See, si. here is the deposit book, Senor Mitchell. Thank you, Valente. <laughs> 145 million pesos. <laughs> that has a very nice sound, eh? Uh, if... I might make a suggestion. I think the deposits are too big. Huh? Uh, the clerk in the bank was completely overwhelmed. So, I do not like that. Argentina is overrun with secret agents. Hmm. The clerk indulges in some harmless conversation, and the next thing, uh, he's being pumped by an enemy's pack. Exactly. And if our enemies find out how much we are banking here... Please, please, please... Do not even mention it. After all the care we have taken here in Argentina, it would be monstrous if we should fail our leader now. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. As Germany's defeat drew nearer, she spurred her plans for survival. American intelligence officers discovered secret orders signed by the German general staff. Every German officer has the duty of saving himself. It is absolutely...
absolutely necessary to save the officer's corps for the reconstruction of the fatherland. Twice Germany has been rebuilt for the world struggle, and each time we have come nearer to success. Officers, prepare yourselves for the third attempt with fresh energy, and then our victory will be assured. You see, son, even with defeat staring them in the face, the Germans planned their third aggression against the world. But wait a minute, Dad. The Allies knew about these plans. How could Germany fool the world again, if they knew? When you hear these facts of history, I can see why the democratic nations must seem foolish to you, son. It seems so simple, doesn't it? But do you know, even as Germany was beginning to crumble the second time, people were still arguing about what to do with it. After all, you can't hold the German people responsible. They didn't all want Hitler. Well, they voted for him, didn't they? Yeah, but they didn't have any choice. Don't you realize that? Well, then, how do you know? Who can be trusted in Germany? Who would you trust? I'll tell you who. The German educators, professors, teachers. You know, you can always trust them. The German educators. (laughs) What nonsense. Four-fifths of them had stayed at their jobs under the Nazis and never made the slightest protest against them. I'll tell you who you can really rely on. The German underground. You can't argue that they're not against the Nazis. Say, that's an idea. Sure, the German underground. We certainly ought to be able to trust them. Yes, that would be something. If you could find the German underground. In novels and stories, yes, you could find them there. The resistance movements in every other country had found ways to get in touch with the outside world. Only the alleged German underground was silent and invisible. Known only as a myth. There was no German underground. Ah, these endless discussions. The truth of the matter was simple and terrible, but very few were able to see it. This was the truth. World conquest by rape and murder had been bred in the bone of the German people for too many years. Before Hitler I, there was the Kaiser. Everything must be put to fire and blood. The throats of men and women, children and the aged must be cut. Not a tree nor a house left standing. With such methods of terror, the war will be finished before two months. While if I use humanitarian methods, it may prolong it for years. And before the Kaiser, there was Bismarck, and Frederick the Great before him, all imbued with Germany's manifest destiny to rule the world, all contributors to the religion of war and mass murder. In the writings of their philosophers, the cult of hate was also revealed. Heinrich von Treisker was one of these. His ideas made him a national hero. Germany must make it a duty to employ enemy traitors in the enemy state. Every good German is a potential spy. Treaties? Treaties must be denounced by Germany whenever they become unprofitable to her. International law? International law does not exist. The nations of the world cannot be reformed. They can only be overthrown. The philosophy of war was fed, too, by the words of Friedrich Nietzsche. In 1887, he wrote, When the instincts of a society make it give up war and conquest, it is decadent. It is ripe for democracy and the rule of shopkeepers. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, one of Germany's greatest men of letters, bowed his head and wrote, I have often felt a bitter pang at the thought of the German people, so estimable as individuals, so wretched in the whole. That was the most profound statement of them all. If the world had understood its meaning, I would not be telling you this story now. What Goethe said? Yes. The German people, so estimable as individuals and so wretched in the whole. Pure wisdom. And how stupid and senseless it made all of these arguments and discussions. Could you trust the good Germans? Were there good Germans? How many? What difference did it make? It didn't matter how many good Germans remained. Even if they did exist, they were ineffectual. They had never stopped the German nation from pursuing its heritage... World conquest by brutality and insane barbarism. Deutschland, Uberalis, rule the world, rule the world. 
Hundred and bad Germans. It was their national theme song, and they loved it. Twice then, my son, these singers of hate and destruction exploded and ravaged the world. Twice they were beaten into submission by the democratic nations. And twice, too, the criminals escaped the punishment due them. After all that, the Germans weren't punished? After all you just told me? Didn't anyone speak out? Only a few, my son. And they were like small voices crying in the wind, trying to warn the world. But no one listened. They were men with the vision of history in their hearts. Men who had found the courage to be heard. And they asked only one thing of the makers of peace. Profit from the difficult lesson we have already learned. Only a hard peace will bring a peaceful world. What do you want to do? Make slaves of the Germans? Is that what you mean? No. What we advise is just and effective punishment. Punishment that will prevent Germany from making war on the world ever again. Punishment that will change the hearts and the minds of the Germans, too. Change their concept of German destiny and empire. Uh Uh-huh. And just how do you expect to do that? By making the peace terms realistic and specific. By planning everything carefully. This time, we must avoid the mistakes we made in the First World War so that not a single guilty German escapes punishment. In fact, that's the way the armistice should begin, by declaring them guilty. But who? Who are the guilty ones? All those whose crimes are known who are responsible for the atrocities. Everyone who participated in the Nazi barbarism. The Nazi party leaders. Hitler, Himmler... Goering, Goebbels, Streicher, and the other mass murderers. They must be killed or imprisoned. Every German officer above the rank of colonel, every member of the Reichstag, killed or imprisoned. The leaders of the Gestapo, the elite guard, the labor and peasant front, killed or imprisoned. What to do with Germany? These experts divide punishments for the German nation as well as for individuals. This is what the military expert proposed. The backbone of Prussian militarism, the German officers' corps, must be completely obliterated. Its survival from the First World War made the second possible. And in addition to this, the German army itself must be dissolved. There can be no doubt that Germany has forfeited her right to to sovereignty. Therefore... She must be completely occupied by the forces of the United Nations. That's a great idea. But what about the cost? Who's going to pay for it? You know who. Your kids. They'll be paying for it. Uh, It's just not practical. On the contrary. This occupation can be carried out by a token force of 300,000 soldiers and a modest air force. All the United Nations will contribute to it. And the cost? Believe me, it'll be small indeed compared with the continued peace which will come from it. And what about the Germans, meanwhile? Don't you think they deserve a place in the sun? Yes. But first they must learn that others are entitled to at least a freckle. What to do with Germany after World War II? The expert in economic affairs also had some specific proposals. If Germany is to be really disarmed, we must go further than the military. She must be disarmed industrially, too. All plants engaged in producing war materials must be demolished. All stockpiles of strategic materials, such as metal, oil, and rubber, must be removed. All industries which made possible the reconstruction of the war machine, metals, chemicals, machine tools, these industries must be completely removed from the German management. Oh, come on now. Let's give credit where it's due. One thing you'll have to admit is German efficiency. Look at all their scientific discoveries. Yes. The Germans are efficient and scientific. They can fly in the air like birds. They can swim under the sea like fish. But there's one thing they have never learned to do. Walk the earth like men. No. German industry must be controlled. They cannot be trusted. What to do with Germany? A great burden fell on the legal expert. The legal concepts which plagued the peacemakers at Versailles can be wiped out with one stroke. The criminal state may no more demand its freedom than the individual criminal. Germany has already been judged guilty by the nations of the world. 
For these crimes, her statehood must be destroyed. There will be no peace treaty for her to break, since treaties can only be made between sovereign states. Germany must be put on probation like any criminal, and only after she earns her statehood should a treaty be made. But won't the Germans resent it? Uh, such harsh treatment, I mean. I suppose <laughs> if a germ, a microbe, could speak, he would call Dr. Pasteur the greatest murderer in history. The Germans have been the scavengers and the scourge of civilization. Does it matter what they think? What to do with Germany after World War II? For the long pole, the most hopeful contribution to the plan was that of the educator. Now, one of the worst of the German crimes has been the mental enslavement of its own youth. Look at these slogans pinned up in Nazi schoolrooms. The final goal, always to be kept in mind in the education of a girl, is that she is one day to become the mother of Germans. Huh? The Ten Commandments are the deposit of the lowest human instincts. Well, I'll be... And here is a literal report of a typical history lesson in a Nazi schoolroom. Fritz, why has God given us the Fuhrer? To save us. From what? From the rest of the world. Why must we despise Christ? Because he was weak and gentle. Why else? Because he was a Jew. To wipe out this sacrilege and this pagan idiocy, Germany must be mentally disarmed too. Her educational system scrapped and replaced by democratic teachings and liberal culture. Her educational system should be entrusted to an international university. And when the Germans prove themselves fit to live with, then, and only then, should they be accepted into the family of nations. So you see, my son, this was the plan of the small voices. Logical, fearless, merciful, correct historically and legally. But alas, these voices were never heeded. That's how Germany came to beat the world in World War III. I can't believe it, Dad. If only the nations of the world could dictate to Germany now. I guess they wouldn't have to stop and argue about it, would they? No, son. But that opportunity is long gone and may never return. Buried in the ruins of civilization... Buried with the calendar leaves of 1945 and 1946. And this little statue, my birthday gift to you, the symbol of liberty, has been burned from the minds of a generation, and soon it will be forgotten by men everywhere. Here, here in our perpetual night, we shall never see again. We look for light, but behold darkness. For brightness but we walk in gloom. Yea, as those that have no eyes do we grope. We are in the dark places like the dead. What? What's that, Dad? That's from the Bible, my son. But of course, you don't know what that is. And you will never know. You are a slave of Germany. <laughs> Come back now, ladies and gentlemen. Come back to 1945. Our glimpse into the future wasn't very comforting, was it? You may even have found it shocking. Well, then remember this. The nightmare we have shown you need never happen. America and the world need never be enslaved if we follow the advice offered in our fantasy. Remember the lesson. Remove the adder's fangs. <laughs> Tonight on Words at War, we've brought you What to Do with Germany by Louis Neiser, a particularly timely book considering the announcement that came out of Yalta today. The radio dramatization was by Edward Jurist. Julian Noah was heard as the father, and Peter Fernandez was his son. The music was arranged and played by William Meader, and the production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader.
Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of Battle Report by Lieutenant Welburn Kelly. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This is the National Broadcasting Company. That will do it for today. If you uh, have a comment, email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. I welcome your story or that of loved ones who served during World War II. Ken Curlin provides our opening theme music, KenCurlin.com. I am your host, Adam Graham. This uh, series is provided as a service of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio, greatdetectives.net.